So Ryo here, welcome back to another premium deck build. Today, we're doing Restanding Riptide. This is actually what I brought to regionals. It was super fun, I enjoyed it a lot. Shoutouts to my buddy Bowen, Bow Wow Lin in the comments for helping me put this together. And shoutouts to Elijah as well for helping me make it more consistent after regionals as well. He and a lot of other Aug Force players have been building this on the sidelines, behind the scenes and making it better. So let's get into it. So to start off, our starter is Bubble Edge Draco Kid. The reason we're running Draco Kid is because without a counter blast cost, to be able to just push him into soul and then pick a unit and give it fourth pile or more when it swings draw a card is actually pretty good because that means we can just target a title and we can make it draw us two cards. So like, let's say we ride Elgos and we have our title, we can call another title and then we can swing with that one, restand, swing with this again, swing with Elgos, any triggers we get, we can stack onto this other title over here. And it doesn't matter if this title's attacks do not hit because regardless, we are going to draw two cards. So when we need to draw into pieces that we don't have in our hand, this is actually pretty nice because we don't waste any counter blast and we have the possibility of getting something that we actually need more and just having to throw an extra restander like this. And as long as we guard for our title over here and protect it, it doesn't matter if we have to call that second title. So next we run six crit because stacking a crit onto a riptide is just extremely deadly when it's restanding three times like it's just absolutely ridiculous and on top of that we run four brave shooter because his generation break one skill will allow him to push into soul and then give our vanguard plus 10 and draw cards so if we have two of these we can put these on the field we can swing with Valios, and then because they both happen at the same time, we push these two in soul first, draw two cards, and then we have two more cards that we can potentially call down with Valios, which means, let's say we have a title and something else, we can swing with title and then swing with something else, and then if we draw into another title by doing this, we can slap a title over the other unit on the Excel circle, or slap a title over another title on an Excel circle and go for more attacks. So Brave Shooter is definitely a 4 of, and it really helps that he's the premium collection trigger. So you're gonna get that 15K guard, that V trigger 10,000 power effect as well. It's just really good. So next we run six draws because we need to draw into pieces and extra cards in hand is never a bad thing. Being able to draw into more restanders so that you don't have to guard, you can just let the restanders die because we will be able to protect them later with G guards. So we really just have to make sure that we draw into all of our pieces that we need for our ring condition. After that, we run four heal, which is pretty self-explanatory, but it even has more of a presence in premium because you need to be able to call your G guardians by tossing out a heal. So if you've never played premium before, just remember basically every deck runs heals and premium as well. There's only like one or two decks in the format that may not use heals for more pressure. So to start off for grade ones, we run the best grade one in the entire deck, Orthea. Orthea has a G break one skill, where if you counter blast one at the end of the battle that she boosted a unit, you can restand it and it gets minus 5k. So that's not really gonna matter that much because Riptide swings for a big 32 and any trigger that we put on that is going to give it another 10k including if we have a crit on it and we're swinging multiple times with the crit it's just extremely deadly but not even on top of that she has resist on v r and g as well so that means you don't have to protect orthea she will literally protect herself which is crazy good because we're going to get that restanding with riptide and then they can't target it as well so she's really good. I highly recommend running three. If you find that you're not hitting her as often and you really need to, then I'd recommend pushing her up to four, but you really only need three. After that, we run three Nikolos. Nikolos is really good because he's an 11K attacker on a regular circle and a 16K attacker on an XL2 just for placing him on VRR. And when you place him on VRR, you're gonna be able to search the top seven for Elgos. So just more consistency, plus actually being able to hit your opponent's Vanguard because of that plus three that he gets, the turn he was placed. So he's definitely a three up. And to finish off our grade ones, we run four Wheel Assault. He's our target ride for grade one. We always want to ride him if possible because being able to cheat a Riptide onto the field 
is just too good. And then we're not losing anything by playing him because we're drawing a card and then calling. So it's not a plus one, but it's not a minus one either. You just kind of get the card back that you call, which is good because you're getting a free unit basically. And his second skill is also good because when he's done boosting something, you can switch the position of two rear guards. So if you have a double riptide column, that riptide in the back row can now be switched into an excel circle with the right setup, which can make your turns even more deadly. And so then you have the restanding riptide and then you still have another riptide attack. Or you can do that double riptide the turn before and then the next turn play Orthea and go for that restanding riptide. So next I run four title assault because he's the best restander in the entire deck and for a single soul blast he'll restand himself and he won't lose any power on the first battle so he's really good for early rushing and then we can also have multiples on the field and get triggers later and then stack them on but generally we're using these to get the extra battles that we need to be able to get up to fourth battle for riptide and then swing for multiple attacks with riptide but being a 14k on a circle and swinging 14 twice if they don't get triggers through all these attacks it just becomes super deadly with title but you always got to run title in basically every build. There's almost no reason not to run title in every single Aqua Force build. So to continue our grade two lineup, we run four Elgos because on first battle, you can CB1 to restand him. So he's just another restander. You can grab it with Nikolos, which is good. And he's a great Vanguard grade two ride because when he attacks, if it's the second battle that turn or more, you can CB1, SB1 and stand one of your rears. So if by any chance you manage to not get any restanders in your hand, Elgos can take your Coral and then make it swing for nine. And then you can swing with this and then stand your Elgos up. And then if you have another unit over here, then you can swing with that, then swing with this. And then this can still go into Soul and draw you a card. Speaking of Coral Assault, we run four of those because a 24K Swinger including something that can be put into soul and draw is just too good not to run. He's just really good for big swings, really good for getting those cards back in your hand. And there's even times where if you get these and no restanders in your hand, it's still not that bad because as long as you can manage to get up to fourth battle and you have two of these here, then you can swing with the one, you can swing with Elgo, so you can stand this back up, swing, swing, and then let's say all of those don't hit, these two go into soul and you draw two. So like you can get the cards back that you've placed down. So even if you can't hit with Coral, at least like you're gonna get something out of it, which makes Coral just really, really good. All right, so onto the grade threes for Naval Gazer because his resource management is just really good. Like throwing one title in an Excel two circle and then swinging, restanding title, swinging again, and then swinging with Naval Gazer for 22 and C being one and standing up title, being able to get up to four attacks with only being able to have title on the field and Naval as your Vanguard is really good. But you can also use them in conjunction with Riptide as well. If you get the right setup, you can actually restand Riptide with Naval. So to continue the grade threes, I run three Hydro because you can place him, get that Excel circle, retire something, and then still stride. So being able to get rid of your opponent's homily and just be like, lol, I can just attack for more than four attacks now. So much for your homily. It's just really, really awesome. Like just to be able to deny them that Hanali that they set up for you. It will depend on the meta, like Elijah was explaining this to me that depending on the meta, you wanna run three Diamantes instead of three Hurricane. I assume what that would mean is if your meta is in a place where your opponent can protect their pieces from retire like this, or like it doesn't matter, like their pieces, you don't wanna take those out, you'd rather rush more in that meta then you definitely want to switch to Diamantes, but Hydra is great for peace hunting. To finish off the main deck, we got four Riptide Dragon. You need to draw into him as much as possible. It does hurt to run four, but getting double Riptide when you have enough resources to be able to get up to enough battles to swing with two Riptides that turn is a lot of pressure. And then to literally just be able to go to another Riptide after that, like, and to be able to restand Riptide is super important, but you need to be able to draw this even with six draws, we're not gonna draw into it sometimes, so you have to run four. I wanna try and see if I can get it down to three, but unfortunately, I just don't think that's possible. 
but Riptide is really nice because it's going to swing for 32k. So being able to rescan this multiple times, especially with triggers like we were talking about before, like stacking crit onto it. Realistically, you're going to use Audrey and then you're going to go 32, restand 34, right? And then you swing boosted by Arthea, minus 5k stand up again, 29. And then you can also use Lambros, which we're going to talk about next, to restand Riptide again before that. And so you use all those in conjunction to swing literally like four times with Riptide. It's just ridiculous. So to start off our G Guardians in our G zone, I run two Ihanis because for a single counter blast on Generation Break 1, she flips up a G Guardian and then you can select up to five units. For each of those units that you selected, she gets plus 5k guard. And then all those chosen units get resist and cannot be hit until end of turn. So that means your entire board can now not be nuked and they have to attack your vanguard the only way they get around that is if they use a board wipe that doesn't specifically target things but still that makes the honeys really deadly and really dangerous to literally be like oh my board of all deadly pieces is now you can't get rid of it and you have to give me damage so you definitely want to run these for that reason and for getting extra cards face up in the g zone for that rare happening where you're going to use Alexandros instead of any of your other strides. So next we run two Gephelia. The reason we run her is because for a single Soul Blast, you can flip her face down from face up, and then you can pick one of your units, whether in a circle or in your damage zone, and flip it face up. So basically she can counter charge and she can unlock. So this is great for facing against Link Joker that locks your units. And it's great for being able to counter charge when you're in a pinch, you actually really, really need it. So you definitely want to run at minimum, at least two Gephelias. So one of the best G Guardians in our deck, Dimsel. Dimsel is a Cray Elemental, which is nice because he can be run in any deck. So you are going to lose 5k guard because he doesn't gain any extra guard, but he has resist on G, so it can't be taken out of the Guardian Circle, which is great. And then when he's placed, you can literally pick a unit and give it resist. So we can place this and then we can give our Riptide resist. Or we can go ahead and we can give our Tidal Assault resist. So basically you can protect your stuff so that you don't have to worry about not being able to protect it. And then it also gives it, it cannot be hit as well. So just like I was saying, it's basically a low cost Ihanis that only affects one unit. So to finish off our G Guardians, we run one Ice Barrier Dragon because if he G guards on the first or fourth battle, he's gonna get plus 10K guard. So it's really just a nice 25K guard if the need ever arises to use Ice Barrier. But most of the time you're never gonna use Ice Barrier. You just that one tech that's useful in a specific situation. So to start off the stride deck, we're running one Sea Breeze. It's really just a tech. I haven't really found any situation in which I actually needed to use Sea Breeze, but I know that that one chance is gonna come up where I'm actually gonna need it and I'm not gonna have it and it's gonna be a problem. I'm gonna do more testing in the future and it may not see any more play. I may not need it, but I think running one Sea Breeze is always good like having that option to be able to just be able to stride even if you can't. Speaking of cards that are a tech that we barely ever use, Megiddo. Megiddo is awesome, but the problem with Megiddo is that Aqua Force swings for low numbers. So unless we have our opponent at five, Megiddo really isn't that scary because they can just no guard and hopefully get a trigger. And if they do get a trigger, like, well, you're kind of screwed at that point. It's not like we're Grand Blue, where Grand Blue can throw a bunch of Skull Dragons in the drop zone to make Megiddo really scary, because getting Riptides in the drop zone isn't exactly easy for us, even if we run four. Like, we'd have to get a significant amount of Riptides into the drop zone to make Megiddo worth it. So Megiddo is really only worth it if they're at five and you need to push for game and you manage to happen to have that same card as your Vanguard in your hand and two CB open, which usually is not the case. So next we run one Whale Boy, I mean Balnera. Balnera is actually not bad. It's just what really cripples it is the fact that if your opponent PGs, like, and you discard a card to get rid of that Guardian on the Guardian Circle, it's still gonna guard for infinite value. 
So in certain situations, Balnera is actually good because let's say they're at five and you have a lot of grade ones in hand and you only got a few restanders and you don't really have your pieces to go for restanding Riptide, then Balnera has that option to basically rip things out, especially if your opponent doesn't have a PG. But most of the time, Balnera really isn't going to find any use. I've been trying to do some testing to see if I can find a use for it, but it's still just a tech. So I might potentially get a lot of hate for this choice, but I only run one Alexandros because Alexandros can flip anything up in the G. We're most of the time not going to use Valnera, so that could be a target or if we don't use Seabreeze. And we really don't need to use Alexandros more than once because if we're going to go into Alexandros, most of the time there's better options to go into a first stride. We're never usually going to go for this unless our opponent doesn't kill us. And then we get the second stride and then they're at five and we have a lot of face up cards in our G zone. Then this becomes a really great option. And it doesn't matter, like I said before, because we can literally just flip anything up. So to be able to rescan two units and give them plus 5k for every card in your G zone can make two restanders really deadly. And then stacking crits on them can make them even more deadly. But Alexandros is kind of one of those things where if they let you to second stride, he's better than using Valios, which is almost never than you want to go into Alexandros. Speaking of Valios, we run two of those because when Valios attacks, you can counterblast one, turn a card face up, and then you can call two cards for every face up card in your G zone. So this is really good because if we flip something up, we have one in there, we can call two cards and then draw the same amount back. So we're not going to lose anything from activating that skill. But if we do have enough where we have like two or more, then we can call like four or more cards basically down and just draw all that back, which is really, really good. It can also be kind of detrimental because you might draw into triggers, which means you don't hit them, which is kind of annoying. But it's still a really good skill to give us more draw and more pieces and more guard. But there's a thing you can do where if you manage to be able to G-guard before your first stride, then you can actually lock them down at 11 with values because you have to have two or more face-up cards in your G-zone to be able to lock them down at 11k, which is amazing because they don't get any triggers. But that is the biggest detriment to values that if you can't early heal to drop a G-guardian into your G-zone, you can't early values. You can't lock them down at 11. You're still going to go into Valios most of the time anyway, just to get that extra draw. But it's one of those things where it's like, it's its biggest weakness. And if it didn't have that restriction would be probably the first turn kill stride of Aqua Force. So our final and our last stride is Lambros. So we're running him because just by swinging for a fourth battle or more, you flip up a copy of them, doesn't cost any counterblast, just that is the cost and stand up two units. And then if you have two or more face-up cards in your G-Zone, they get plus 10k. So this works really well in tandem because essentially this is what we can do. We got our Riptide here, we got our Orthea here, we got our Audrey here. And then let's say we got our title and we just got any generic unit over here with maybe a booster. So we, we CB1 and we take Audrey, we put it into Soul, we select Riptide, right? So Riptide is not gonna swing just yet. We're gonna swing with title twice up here. Then we're gonna swing with this over here. Now we're at three battles. So now we can swing with Riptide. So we swing with Riptide for fourth and then Audrey skill activates, restanding it and giving it plus 2K until end of turn. So now when we restand it with Orthea, it's realistically only gonna lose 3K, which is great. So that's our first Riptide swing. So now that it's at fourth battle from our last Riptide swing, it doesn't matter. We can keep swinging with Riptide now. So we're gonna swing with Riptide again that's our second attack, right? So then we swing with Lambros and we restand our title and our Riptide up here. And then if we get the plus 10K, that's great. But if we don't, it's not the end of the world. We can go ahead and swing with this title up here and hope that we can hit again. If they haven't hit any triggers or don't have enough guard, we can still swing with that again. So that's already gonna be five attacks, but any triggers that we get with Lambros before we attack with this title again for the sixth, is we're gonna stack any crits onto Riptide and we can stack the power onto Tidal. Like if we get a crit, we're gonna put all the effects on Riptide and then any other triggers we get, we're gonna put onto Tidal, but we're gonna keep the, the crits on Riptide. So then we're gonna be able to swing for a third battle with Riptide boosted by Orthea. CB1, stand up, 
minus three because we got the plus two from Andre. So then he swings again. And then your, your opponent's basically dead at that point. Like, there's no way that they're still alive after that. And even if they are alive after that, there's a good chance that you've literally crippled their game to the point where next turn, they're not gonna be able to kill you unless they're an insanely resourceful deck. But even at that point, you might have enough cards in hand still to be able to survive the turn. Well guys, that's the end of the build. If you enjoyed it, make sure to stand up that like button. If you didn't, make sure to hit that dislike and let us know in the comments with a constructive criticism on how we can improve on that. Make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon for all our notifications. And as always guys, let the wind blow.